Good morning, good morning. If you like that video and you'd like to share it on your social media or other good videos like it, you can download the app. We lo uh, love these guys. Yes, he is. And there's a link to it on our website, I think, as well. Just a great, uh, a great way to redeem social media for good and biblical and godly things. Amen? A couple quick things as we open our Bibles. Revelation chapter 6. We've been studying verse by verse through the New Testament, and here we are, having concluded chapter 5 last week, we continue into chapter 6, verse 1. This morning, the title for our message today, The Beginning of the End, as we now enter into a particular portion of Revelation. A couple quick things. First of all, a lot of changes coming up, so make sure... And as we've changed our format for Sunday mornings, there's no formal announcement time, so don't miss a lot of what goes on during the week and what's coming up, home fellowships, all kinds of other activities. Uh, keep your eyes on the screen. There are, everything's in your bulletin, so keep aware that way. On the website as well, we'll try and get uh, current content up there uh, so we can be aware of all the things that are coming up. With that, uh, did you enjoy the worship this morning? Yeah. Of course you did. Our, our golden, where's he at? Our golden, he's, he's with the youth, our golden voiced angel. He's like a, he's the melody man is what he is. He just hits a melody like math. It's like math. He hits a melody so well. So this is our last Sunday for a while with James as he heads down to Bible college. Uh, next week, he's going to the Calvary School. Uh, praise the Lord. Just such an exciting time. Go ahead. As he just begins his, you know, more formal training and education for ministry, so excited just to, to see what the Lord is doing with this guy. And he'll be back. He'll come to visit, hopefully, a lot. But uh, there's something special when a man, and I don't, you know, demean him or anything, but when a man kind of, okay, you know, he gets a call of God, and then he kind of just goes and does what the Lord calls him to do. Uh, it's exciting to see, and uh, we'll continue to be a part of his life as uh, the Lord directs him and leads him and guides him. We're going to have a little cake because that just seems like a good idea, right? A little cake after second service if you can hang around, pray for him. Uh, exciting time. So make sure you stick around. Make sure you, you tell him how much he means to you. Uh, some of you have been around longer than others. We've watched this little guy. He's never really a little guy, was he? Right? But I don't know, a little guy. He's, he's a littler. Grow into this man of God. And uh, I could say lots more, but uh, it's exciting to see what the Lord's up to. Let's pray. Let's get into our text. Boy, we've got a lot to cover. I pray you brought your thinking caps with you. I pray you brought some uh, sharpened number two pencils because, you know, that's all you can take notes with. Um, I'm kidding. I'm kidding. Gotcha. I may do that from time to time throughout the message because, um, you know, we need to keep ourselves sharp through this stuff. So hopefully you have your number two pencil and a piece of paper. You can take some good notes, even as we work our way through this text. Father, we love you. We thank you that we can enjoy you, and we can enjoy our time in your word. We want to simply read and reverently receive what's here, apply it as you've given it to us to have an effect on us. And so, Lord, we just pray to find what that purpose is. Speak to us that we can be more effective for you, reflecting your glory, shining as lights into, into a dark world, Lord, bringing flavor and preservation, being salt as we're fishers of men. God, use us in our generation to do what you've called us to do, to build up your church and to save souls from hell, God. That's why we're here. What a glorious purpose. Work on me, work on us today, Lord, so that um, we can be more effective. Strip us and free us, Lord, from things that slow us down and distract us and hinder us, stuff that just doesn't matter. Would this view of what's coming, God, sober us to ensure that our lives are uh, we're directed to the calling you've given us. We thank you, Lord, we love you. Bless your people. Thank you that they're here today. Thank you that they've come for Jesus. Thank you that we get to open the Bible now and wherever, Lord, we are, we're, we're studying. We're seeing and hearing and receiving. We're growing. 
Refresh them today, Lord. Those who are watching, those who are listening on the web, God, just reach out and uh, just work in their life, we pray. Get them here, Lord, next service. In Jesus' name, Lord, we thank you. We say together, amen, amen. Pastor Chuck said this. People often wonder, what does the future hold? Beginning in the fourth chapter of the book of Revelation, we do enter into future events, as we've discussed. He says, but there's a vast difference, consider this, in the future, and it's all related to your relationship with Jesus Christ. For the believers, there is a glorious future ahead, and we've talked about that, haven't we? For the unbelievers, and that's kind of where we're at this morning, there is real trouble ahead. He says, big trouble. Hopefully you read ahead this last week, Revelation chapter 6. As you simply open the Bible and read this chapter, we see immediately that it's kind of different than what we've covered previously, right? There's a, there's a drastic change. There's a shift in the tone, in the content of this prophetic letter. And that's because, as one Bible student said, Revelation begins... Pardon me, Revelation 6 begins a dark period in history. In chapter 1, we see the vision of the Lamb in glory. Let's rehearse this. In chapters 2 and 3, we see the seven churches of the Lamb. In chapters 4 and 5, we see the glory of the Lamb in heaven before the throne. However, in chapters 6 through 19, we learn of the wrath of the Lamb, even as we'll read this morning. John is our guide, John the Apostle, banished to the island of Patmos. There he is in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and he receives this prophetic revelation. Chapter 6, as we continue and shift gears a little bit, we are entering into the time period that the Bible calls the Great Tribulation. There's many names for it in the Scripture. If you want to jot a few of these things down, the Day of the Lord, we're going to reference that this morning. The time of Jacob's trouble, we've talked about that. The 70th week of Daniel, and we'll touch on that later. And there are actually a, a few other references which you can discover, search out for yourself, and pat yourself on the back about. I'm kidding, that's a Bible joke. Good morning, good morning. But this is the seven-year period of time wherein the wrath of God and that's a serious thing, isn't it? The wrath of God is being poured out on a Christ-rejecting world. Three observations I want to make as we kind of introduce this hopefully short season through the Great Tribulation, chapters 6 through 19. Three observations that I pray you jot down and keep in mind as we work our way through. Firstly, it is a specific moment in our future history and that's a crazy expression, right? Our future history. But without question, it kind of communicates the right point. It's a futuristic event, but it's a moment that is set. It's fixed in mankind's or Earth's history. It's going to be the most difficult period of time the world has ever known. And it's going to have an effect on every single person, as we'll read today. Every person who lives on this planet. It is a fixed moment in our future history. And we say that because it's important. There are many different views, and you know this, right? Do not go on YouTube, amen, to get your theology, to study really any book of the Bible, especially Revelation. User beware. That's a joke, anyway. Be careful. There's all kinds of just, you know, eccentric viewpoints on these things. As we study them, we want to be conservative, we want to be biblical, we want to be good students, but for mostly, we want to receive what God has written simply. And as we do that, well, Revelation kind of just unfolds itself before us, doesn't it? Some look at these things as events that have already transpired. Do you know that? If you've never heard that before, does that strike you as kind of comical? It's okay. Dear brothers and sisters, hold this view. They're called preterists. They call themselves, you know, sometimes by fancy names and titles. Anyway, I'm having a little fun with this, so just be forewarned. we got to laugh at ourselves just a little to make sure we're not being too serious and too, you know, egocentric, self-inflated, I think. 
But there are those who believe good, you know, God bless them, brothers and sisters. They believe the great tribulation, the whole book of Revelation. It's already all happened in the past. 70 AD, and you can look into these things in your own time, but they say, we're living in the millennium right now. Isn't it great? Peace on earth and Jesus reigning from Jerusalem. This is super. And you look at that and consider this and say, well, God bless you. I'm not so sure. I don't really read the book of Revelation that way. People have reasons for believing oftentimes what they do. God be with them. God bless them. We don't hold that viewpoint here. I do not think whatsoever that these things have already transpired. Folks, when you read the things we're going to see, when you imagine what's going to take place upon this planet, we've seen nothing like this yet. And that's important, and it's for a reason. Secondly, this is a fixed point in our history. And it's important to remember this because others will say that everything written in the book of Revelation is purely symbolism, not literal, not real. Um, without question, what we see here, especially in chapters 6 through 19, is observational truth. Can you say those two words out loud? Observational truth. Here's what that means. You look at it, you read it, you receive it, you believe it, and oftentimes that's all we do with it. We're careful not to come to conclusions that we invent or create ourselves. There are many things here that are symbolic, but that doesn't mean they're not literal, that they're not things and events that are actually going to occur. One great rule for Bible study is this, and it comes through Pastor Chuck and probably from someone else before him. Generally, the simplest interpretation is the most correct or best interpretation. If you have to write a whole series of volumes that explain how you get from, you know, point A to point B, I'm not so sure. Oftentimes you get lost on the way, right? You follow? The simplest interpretation, that is, just as the scripture reads, guys, that's probably what it means. And though it may be difficult to, at first, understand, receive it in faith. This isn't fiction. It's in part symbolic, but guys, it is literal. This is a specific event and moment that's fixed in our future history. Some of it is observational truth. Say that again. But it doesn't mean it's not literal. The Bible's not written in code. Do you know this? Some say that it is. God bless them. They have videos on YouTube and stuff. Remember we talked about that. The Bible's not written in code, guys. It's written in English. Praise the Lord. And it's written in lots of other languages. You know why? Because God wants you to understand it. Blessed is he. You remember? Chapter 1, verse 19. Blessed is he who reads and, you know, so on and so forth. This book especially. God wants us to understand. We don't have to jump through hoops and, you know, do the backwards math and play records backwards. I don't know. You with that? You know, get all weird, right, looking for something that's not there. There's a lot packed into this Word of God. But again, the simplest interpretation, and that's what we're going to cover here this morning, chapters 6 through 19, is most often the best way to go. So though there's some symbolism, though there's a lot of observational truth, listen, stuff that we read and we just say, okay, okay. Understand this, this is a literal, actual fixed moment in our history. Number two, an important observation on the Great Tribulation. What's the point, what's the purpose of all this content, right? The bulk of this book, chapters 6 through 19, what's the point of all this? Why did God give John a vision of this fixed point in our future, the, the worst period of time man will ever know when God's wrath is being poured out? Again, on a Christ-rejecting world, judgment's coming. Why would God give this vision in the first place? I pray you write this down. It's not so we would sit around arguing about whose viewpoint is more correct. What a waste of time. I hope you don't do that. But this vision has been given as a warning to mankind that, listen, judgment for sin is very real. It's very right. And it's on its way. There are those, and I pray 
none sitting here this morning, but there are those who say that sin's not a big deal. Doesn't have consequences. Oh, this morality stuff, you know, aren't we just and can't we, you know? Final judgment, the blood of Jesus. It's not for me. It's not necessary. I'm good to go with the big guy upstairs, you know? Peter talked about that kind of philosophy. Surely there's not a once and for all outpouring of judgment upon sin and sinful man. God says, I'm sorry, that's not reality. But there absolutely will be a final judgment once and for all. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. It's important that we understand And remember, observe this warning and spread it, share it with those who need to receive it. And I need to receive it. Amen? Amen. We make far too light of sin in these last days, don't we? I pray you don't. Pray for me that I don't. Thirdly, and we'll get into the text, and we've talked about this previously, but again, as as we dive into this radical, terrible, awful stuff, it's important to state once again a mile marker, a foundational point. The tribulation is not for believers. What does that say? Well, that's, that's exactly what it says. The tribulation is not for believers in Jesus Christ. We talked about this in chapter 4, verse 1. As we see in verse 1, the day and moment we're looking forward to, I pray, and preparing for more than any other, and that's the rapture of the church. There we are, four and five in heaven. I'm there, and I hope you are too. Amen. There we are in heaven as all this is about to take place on the earth. The great tribulation is not for believers in Jesus Christ, and thus we don't have to be afraid. There's terror in these chapters, guys. Just terrible things. Great fear. And part of that is the point, but understand this. If you are trusting in the finished work of Jesus Christ, it's not for you, and you do not have to be afraid. Some don't like it when we say that. Do you know this? Some will say things like, well, doesn't your sin deserve the wrath of God? How come the wrath of God's going to be poured out on everybody else's sin but not yours? Are you different? Are you special? Are you better? And to that we say what? No. That's an easy answer, folks. Are you better than the rest of us? Does your sin not deserve the wrath of God? You say what? No, of course not. Every ounce of wrath that I deserve was poured on Jesus Christ, all of it. We're going to see wrath 6 through 19 just being poured out over and over again. A righteous God judging a guilty people. And yet, this is the glory of the gospel, isn't it? I'm no different than you, we can testify and say. And every ounce of wrath that I deserve was poured out on him, the one who hung on the cross for me. It's beautiful. It's important, it's powerful, and it's a good answer to the question. When we talk about being spared from the wrath of God, another question comes out of the mouth of cynical, you know, people. They ask questions like, well, does your sin not deserve the wrath of God? They also say things like, well, doesn't the Bible say that we'll go through trials, trouble, tribulations? Are you saying that you're spared from difficulty? And we're just going to kick back on a lounge chair and just float our way into heaven, as it were, living it easy, and so on and so forth. And when they say such things, we graciously graciously say, well, no, because that's not what the Bible says. We must, through many difficulties, enter the kingdom of heaven. As Paul taught us and Jesus told us, if we're going to live godly in Christ Jesus, we're going to suffer persecution. In this world, you will have trouble. The word is tribulations. But be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Oh, you, you pre, uh, pre-wrath, pre-tribulational rapture people, you're just seeking to be spared from trouble. Tribulations. Sure. Guilty. That was a joke. But not really the point. Again, Jesus promised difficulty. It sharpens us. James said, be of good cheer. Count it all joy when you fall into various troubles, trials, tribulations, because God's working on you. He's building faith and sharpening you for service. 
But that has nothing to do with the great tribulation, folks. We know this, and we know that. This day, this moment, this time, this season, this hour is not for us. And frankly, and this is my opinion, to suggest that we will be here to experience the wrath of God is a spit in the face of Jesus Christ. Oh, we're going to be here. We're going to suffer because, you know, we're sinful, and so the wrath of God's going to be poured out on us. Didn't Jesus bear that? Didn't Jesus take that? So what are we saying? I'm going to pay the price a little bit for my sin? No. It's demeaning his person, his work, his glory. I'm not going to touch that. How about you? I'm going to say he paid the price for my sin in its entirety. And yeah, I'm going to have difficulties and they're good for me. They'll make me healthy, keep me sharp, keep me focused. And not lazy as a Christian, but that has nothing to do with the price for my sin. The wrath of God was simply and absolutely poured out on him. So lastly, what's the point? And I've asked myself this question this week. Kind of tempting, right? Let's just skip over 6 through 19. Anybody? What's the point of studying all these things, the bulk of the book, 6 through 19, the Great Tribulation? There's probably lots of good reasons why we would study it. First of all, because it's in the Bible, and we don't get to pick and choose. Amen? Amen. Secondly, it's full of super cool, and that's not a theological term, but that's okay. It's full of super cool um, prophetic insights, and, and we'll see that in chapter 6 this morning. I mean, there's so much there that kind of broadens our gaze uh, into the things of the Lord. So we can be equipped in many smaller ways, but for mostly... Thirdly, studying the Great Tribulation is the greatest motivation I've ever found for getting out the door of the church and preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. How can we not, in light of what is a fixed point in our history, what's coming without question, and that's divine judgment, seeing, reading, hearing, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen. 15, you get the rest, right? All the way up to chapter 19, there's a lot in between. Nothing I've found focuses and sobers Christians more than to think and to see and to hear about judgment coming upon souls that God loves when it doesn't have to be that way. We know that it's coming, and so guys, we've got work to do. These things are literal, they are real. And I don't want anyone in my life to endure them or encounter them. How about you? And so we get to work. What a season to be sharpened and sobered as we work our way through chapters 6 through 19. Can you amen that? All that being said, we're going to very quickly work our way through this chapter, believe it or not. Verse 1, chapter 6, if you weren't with us, Chapter 5 comes before chapter 6. There's a brain buster for you. And yet its content is important to take note of because it does precede it. Uh, uh, I saw a scroll in the one, in the hand of the one who sits on the throne, John said, and Jesus, the Lamb of God, comes and he takes that scroll. We talked about that. Listen to our message from last week. Seven seals. He begins to open those seals. And again, with each seal that he opens or breaks, a corresponding judgment or action um, is seen on planet Earth. Let's read verse 1 about the first one. Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures, we've talked about them, saying with a voice like thunder, come and see, or just come is what it says. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to what? Conquer. Who are we dealing with here? It's important to identify this character, and here's where good study pays off exponentially, because we can learn the identity of this person, without question, not confuse who he is, based on the scripture that we have. Some would say it's Jesus, and I tell you what, folks, it's not Jesus Christ. 
But don't feel too bad if you've been deceived because many will be by this character. This is the greatest anti-Christ, the one who's contrary to Christ, the one who's a fabrication of Christ that the world will ever know. Someone said, a counterfeit tries to appear as close to the real thing as possible. Some commentators think this is Jesus Christ, probably because the rider is on a white horse. We've seen too many cowboy movies, if you get that. We said to the first service, well, doesn't the hero always come? He wears a white hat and he rides. Oh, okay. It's not him. It's not Jesus. If this is Jesus Christ, here this author says, we then have a chronology problem and a purpose problem. Jesus at this point is in heaven opening the seals, and it would seem unusual to have Jesus coming to this earth only to leave carnage in his wake. You'll know a person by what? You'll know a person, yes, by their fruit, right? We're going to check out this fellow's fruit, and we're going to see the fruit of Jesus Christ in Revelation 19, 20, when he comes back to the earth with us. They're very different. Let's go straight to the scripture, 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 1. Paul taught this particular church a great deal about end-time events, about the rapture, about the second coming of Christ, about the Antichrist, the character that we're now being introduced here to in Revelation 6. And this is great, because it specifically spells it all out, guys. Read with me, I pray you feel the same way. Paul said, Now, dear brothers and sisters, let us clarify some things about the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and how we will be gathered to meet him. Don't be so easily shaken or alarmed by those who say that the day of the Lord has already begun. You know what that is, right? It's an expression. We've talked about this. Uh, 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 Equating the great tribulation. They're synonymous terms. Don't let anyone come to you and say, ah, We're in the midst of the great tribulation. God has forgotten us and the wrath of God has come upon us and all these things. Don't watch their videos. Don't buy their books, man. Right? He says, do not believe them even if they claim to have had a spiritual vision, a revelation, or even a letter supposedly from us. Don't be fooled by what they say. Listen. For that day, the great tribulation, the day of the Lord, that day will not come until there is a great rebellion or a great falling away. And secondly, the man of lawlessness, that's a title for Antichrist. The man of lawlessness is revealed, the one who brings what? Destruction. Destruction. We'll talk about that. He will exalt himself and defy everything that people call God and every object of worship. He will even sit in the temple of God, claiming that he himself is God. Verse 8, we're skipping down. Then the man of lawlessness will be revealed, but he's no match for my Jesus. But the Lord Jesus will kill him with the breath of his mouth and destroy him by the splendor of his coming. This man will come to do the work of Satan with counterfeit power and signs and miracles. He will use every kind of evil deception to fool those on their way to destruction because they refuse to love and accept the truth that would save them. So that's the deal. So God will cause them or allow them to be greatly deceived, and they will believe these lies, then they will be condemned for enjoying evil rather than believing the truth. Love has no meaning without choice, right? Sometimes I hate the fact that I have choice. How about you? Because I'm so dumb. Amen? Amen that. Way to be built up, pastor. You know, but it's just the truth, right? Better to speak the truth in love than to tell a lie. Choice. God provides another option. The love of God through Jesus Christ, forgiveness of sin, salvation, or something else. And this is that something else. It's the culmination of all the something else's that's led up to this man, this person. He represents it all. You've got two ways to go, up or down, heaven or hell, Jesus or Antichrist. Amen? 
Really two choices in life, and there is no in-between. Not choosing is a choice. The Lord has his hand extended to us. Allow me to save you. Trust me, believe me. And not accepting is rejecting. And that's what we're reminded of here. It's so much of what this man represents, this character that we call Antichrist. Daniel chapter 9, write this down. You can read more about him there. Man, so many of you actually wrote that down when I said that. It's great. Daniel chapter 9, you can read more about this guy, but his history, and again, it's future history, is laid out before us, kind of what's going to occur and so on and so forth. Um, as Paul says here to the Thessalonians, as Daniel prophesies, this is a guy who will come on the scene politically. He'll masquerade as Messiah. He'll deceive Jews and Gentiles alike. He will do, at least at first, he will do what no one in earth's history has ever been able to do, and that is bring global peace, or at least it'll seem that way. And again, it only points to the failure of man to do or be anything truly good. We'll get to that in a minute. But he'll come, he'll broker peace in the Middle East. And we were kind of talking about in the first service just how comical it is that every, you know, political leader who's coming on the scene, man, they, they got to head to the Middle East, right? And they're going to sit down with Jew and Muslim and they're going to make this thing happen. They're going to do it. They're going to bring peace to the Middle East. God says, no one will but this one. It won't last long. But this one will come, and he will broker a peace treaty between Jew and Muslim, and the whole world, as it were, because the church is gone, will come together in global harmony. Halfway through, two and a half years in, to this seven-year peace plan, he'll remove his mask, he'll demand to be, as we just read, worshipped as God, or he'll slaughter anyone who won't worship as he demands to be worshipped. We're going to learn a little more about this one as we work our way through Revelation. Jesus said, John 5, 43, and understand the context of this statement, Jesus is talking to the Jewish religious leaders who were rejecting him as their Messiah. Jesus said, I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, we just read that about this guy. If he comes in his own name, him you will receive. And I believe Jesus is there prophesying of future history. The reception, the uh, 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 Jewish people are going to embrace this man as Messiah. This is the one that God promised would come. But things are not going to work out very well. Back to our text, as we go down this list, kind of the description is given. He's on a white horse. We know Jesus is going to return on a white horse with you and me. But again, the description breaks down from there. Jesus wields, as we'll go on to see, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. This guy has a bow. And Bible students are divided, whether this is a bow and arrow kind of thing, descriptive of a character that we're introduced to, in Genesis chapter 10, by the name of Nimrod, you can read about this guy. He's kind of a, an illustration, a type, a picture of Antichrist because he kind of does the same thing that Antichrist will do. Kind of an illustration there. Some will say it's not a bow and arrow, but it's a rainbow, a emblem of the way in which he brings about peace, um, which is through a treaty. Peace. Not won by warfare, but brought on by this political power that he seems to have. We go down the list here. We see that a crown is given to him, right? Not the case with Jesus Christ. He wears a crown, and it's a diadem. It's a crown of royalty. We've made this distinction before. A crown that only truly God can wear. But this guy's given a crown. It's a temporary crown. He has no authority of himself, but it's granted to him. Without question, I pray, we see who we're dealing with here. Someone said, the whole context and character of these seals absolutely forbid our thinking of this rider being the Lord Jesus, as so many affirm. His reign shall not bring war, famine, and strife in its train. 
And we'll talk about that later. But lastly on this verse, it's through this first seal that God seems to be giving mankind what it wants and what it's always wanted. A a political leader, a man who's finally going to get it right, get it done. You see, we're good people, God. We're not sinners. We're not broken. We're not upside down. We're not backwards. If only we had some time to evolve. We're getting better, you see. The political process is being refined. Whatever else. God's giving them, us, man, as it were, what we've always wanted, and that's a a leader, a man who can finally pave the way, peace on earth and every other such thing. We can do it. Some still believe that to be true. And it's not. This peace won't last. It can't last because as always with us, sin promises to provide everything, doesn't it? The man of sin will say it all, sell himself so well. But just like sin says to us, I guarantee fulfillment, satisfaction, just give in. Never works out that way in the end, does it? Aren't you glad God's honest with us about sin? He says it only ends in death. Slow or, you know, a little faster. But it only goes to the same place, and that's death. I pray that this is our understanding. I pray that we can see that so clearly here in this chapter. And be done with the folly, the nonsense, the foolishness wherein we think that sin can satisfy, wherein we think that there's something there to, you know, be enjoyed or benefited from. Guys, there's no hope for our race or for sin itself. No satisfaction there. It's only found in turning from sin and following our Savior, Jesus Christ. Can you amen that? Verse 3. When he opened the second seal, things are getting quite dark from here. I heard the second living creature saying, Come, or come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it. Read that again. Authorities given by God to this one, this writer. These judgments are coming from God himself. He's in control. He's the one pouring out wrath. Was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth. And that people should kill one another and there was given to him a great sword. It's interesting that this writer doesn't need to bring war and murder and death. All he is commissioned to do is take peace from the earth, and man takes care of the rest. We resort quite quickly to war and murder and bloodshed, and that's a powerful picture we kind of camped on for just a minute in the first service. Someone said, peace between men and nations is a gift from God. It's not the natural state of relations between men. It's an important point for us to consider kind of in the same theme that we're rehearsing this morning. What good is there in us at all? None. Nothing. Zero. Zip. Zilch. We lost it. We gave it all away. The grace of God is a radical thing, isn't it? I think when we get to heaven, we're going to see how effectively the grace of God worked in our lives and other people's lives and on planet Earth just to keep us from, you know, blowing ourselves up and murdering everybody and and, and just radical like evil. How actively the grace of God is working right now. There's going to come a day when peace, a part of this grace, is taken away. And what's going to happen? Right? That's a huge statement as to the grace of God. We take it for granted. That's just kind of how we work. But let's start to thank the Lord for the grace that's present and at work in our lives. We don't see it, but believe you me, it's there, right? You get that? Verse 5, when he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come, come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand, and I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, 
three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not touch, do not harm, do not destroy the oil and wine. The scales here seem to symbolize um, the need for food to be, you know, closely monitored, um, scarcely given out. It speaks of um, uh, the lack of food and famine. Someone said, these prices are about 12 times higher than normal. It means that it would cost a day's wage to buy the ingredients for a loaf of bread. This describes a time of famine when life will be reduced to the barest necessities. Even in the midst of, you know, scarcity and famine, there's still the the nature of man which hasn't changed. It's interesting, there's a lot of conjecture about this statement. You can, you know, give your own best guess if if you so desire. But this one is commanded, um, cut the food supply, but don't touch the oil and wine. Those who, again, uh, seem to be well-off and wealthy are, are still enjoying the decadent things of life, even when others are starving, they're kind of, you know, let them eat cake. You get that, right? Perfect uh, statement. If you haven't read history, ask somebody after, after the service, they'll tell you what that means. But that's kind of what sums this up. Let them starve, you know, and, and we're going to sit in our decadence and, and in our, uh, anyway, you get the point. Let them eat cake. That's the, that's the summarization of that that section. Verse 7, when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, come and see. So I looked and behold, a pale horse and the name of him who sat on it was death and Hades or hell followed with him and power was given to them. Again, power that comes from God, authority that comes from God. He's pouring out wrath. He's judging. A fourth of the earth, and this is radical, right? We've never seen anything like this before. We've seen war and famine and destruction and and so much. I mean, those of you that have served in the military, those of you that have been around long enough, you've seen kind of the the nature of man, the effect of some of these things, and it's just, it's, it's radical, but we've seen nothing compared to what's coming, guys. There's nothing remotely comparable to what's gonna take place on planet Earth during this time. A fourth of the Earth, power was given, to kill with sword, hunger, death, and by the beasts of the earth. Radical, right? Mankind's never seen anything like what's coming. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 21, for there will be greater anguish than at any time since the world began, and it will never be so great again. In fact, Unless that time of calamity, the great tribulation is shortened, not a single person will survive, but it will be shortened for the sake of who? God's elect or God's chosen one, the nation Israel. And we'll get back to them in a minute. Power was given to them to kill what would seem a fourth, a quarter of Earth's population. Radical. Verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. It's an interesting observational truth, and that's what this is. Much can be learned about the heavenly scene by looking into the tabernacle of the Old Testament. We observe that. There's an altar there. There's an altar here in heaven. John says, I saw under that altar, and that's a specific place as we study the book of Leviticus. It's where the blood of the sacrifice was poured out as an act of worship. It's precious to the Lord. And so, too, the lives of martyred believers still are today and will be in our future history. I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. They were killed on earth, thus, most likely... Their bodies were still on earth, but where were their souls? Their souls are with the Lord in heaven. We don't head off into limbo when we die, folks, to be absent from the bodies, to be present with the Lord. That's radical. That's encouraging. There they are in the presence of God. But they're not quite like us, and we'll get back to this in a minute. 
We're in our new bodies, man. We're like Jesus. We're with him. We've been changed. We're not, you know, unembodied spirits or souls. But we've got a new body like we see that Jesus had in his post-resurrection state, right? It's going to be super cool. I don't know what you'll look like. I bet you'll be more handsome. We'll all be a little better looking. A little more in shape. You know, I don't know, but it's going to be good, right? It's going to be perfect. But these guys aren't that way, not yet. And that helps us to identify these characters. As we talked about previously, halfway through his seven-year peace plan, that's what the Bible tells us, Antichrist will break this peace treaty. He'll turn on everybody and say, worship me or die. And anyone who does not worship him as God, anyone who does not take his mark, and we'll talk about that later, he will annihilate, he'll kill them, he'll destroy them. And there's going to be lots of folks, Revelation teaches us, who will not worship him as God, will not take his mark, and they will be killed. They're believers in Jesus. When your life is on the line, worship me or die, those who don't care will worship him. Without question. Why not? Unless they have someone who's a higher authority over their life. Unless they're a believer in Jesus Christ. And we see Jews and Gentiles alike will be being saved even in the midst of all this. And it's radical. They won't bow down. They won't take the mark. And so he will take their lives. He'll kill them. But there they are. Their souls are seen in heaven. Here's an interesting commentary, verse 10. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren, who would be killed as they were martyrs, was completed. Rest, wait, just a little while longer. How long, O oh Lord? We have two examples in the scripture of blood crying out for justice. Genesis chapter 4, verse 10. The blood of Abel, innocent Abel, the murder that's taken place, cries out for justice, for judgment. Numbers 35, just speaking in reference to many of the the murders that were taking place in Israel amongst God's people in that lawless time. The Lord gives us commentary. You picture that for a minute. The blood of those slain unjustly cries out to God for justice. That's radical, right? So to these mar martyrs, we simply observe this here, do the same thing. How long, O oh Lord, till we get justice? This is wrong. This is not right. Compound that, like over Earth's history, and maybe that helps to answer some of the questions we have in regard to justice and judgment, right? Can you imagine that? Every single soul slain unjustly, not to mention every other sin, crying out, how long, how long? Aren't you going to do something? When will this be made right? This is wrong. This is not okay. Crying out under that altar for justice. It's a powerful, powerful, powerful picture. Can you amen all that? Rest a little while longer. Maybe you're dealing with something in your life that's difficult and you're saying this is not right and this is not fair and how long, how long, how long, God? until you make it right. A little while longer. I think there's encouragement there. A little while longer. I've got this. Thank you. Go ahead. God says, I've got this. I've got this. A little while longer. I've got a plan. Right now, people are getting saved. So just rest a little while longer. I hear you. Cool it. Rest a little while longer. I I've got a few more people to call into heaven. And that's what's happening in this great tribulation. People are getting saved. They still are getting saved, aren't they? Jew and Gentile alike, and it's radical to me. There are those who say, well, why not just wait until the church gets raptured, right? Wait until the tribulation begins and then, you know, cry out to the Lord and be saved and so on and so forth. Well, I suppose you could choose that. I don't recommend it because you're going to be murdered, martyred along with these guys. So I don't recommend that. 
it's much easier to take a stand for the Lord today when it's <laughs> celebrated and relatively easy. Are you going to take a stand for the Lord then when Antichrist will kill you and behead you? That's what the scripture says. Is it going to be easier then? Are you likely to then call on the Lord for salvation? Probably not. Paul said this, indeed the right time is now. Today is the day of salvation. Amen? We've got to wrap this up. We're out of time. Thank you for your patience. Sorry that I'm long-winded, full of hot air. That's a pastor joke. It's okay. It's okay. You can laugh at that. But we'll wrap this up. Verse 12. And I looked lastly when he opened the sixth seal, and behold, things get crazy. There was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair. The moon became like blood. The stars of heaven fell to the earth as a fig tree drops its late figs when it's shaken by a mighty wind. Then the sky receded as a scroll when it's rolled up, and every mountain and island was moved out of its place. And the kings of the earth, the great men, the rich men, the commanders, the mighty men, every slave, every free man, hid themselves in the caves and in the rocks of the mountains, and said to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath has come. And who is able to stand? The answer in this context is no one, nothing, right? Rich or poor, slave or free, all men are on the same level here as God pours out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. What is going on in this section? I don't know. How about you? The fact is this, we don't know. This is observational truth. I think the best explanation is, is, is provided by many commentators. Nuclear war fits the context, is seen in the chapter kind of described in a loose sort of way by John there. That fits the bill pretty well. Someone said, it's best to regard these pictures as real, but poetic. John isn't using technically precise scientific language, but he simply describes what he saw. What's happening here? I don't know. And neither do you. Amen? Amen? Choosing to be honest is wiser than making something up with no evidence. Amen? Amen? Here's what we know. God is at work. He's the one responsible. He's the one behind what we're seeing. And what is all of this demonstrating, proving without question? And it's this. The depravity of man, isn't it? Consider all that they're seeing, all that's happening, all that's going on. There's no question as to whether God's real. Is God real? Is, is Jesus the Lamb? Is he real? Let me think about that. For a that's all there, right? And yet, what do these men say? They don't cry out to the rock of ages, save me. They cry out to the rocks of the earth to kill them and crush them and save them and spare them from the wrath that's being poured out on them. Someone said, what sinners dread most is not death, but the revealed presence of God. That helps to explain a lot and I think answer a number of questions that we have in regard to those who live on the earth with us. What will it take, we say? Lord, just show them a miracle. Give them a sign. Give them a wonder. Lord, what's it going to take for them to believe? It is the saddest thing to consider, but it is absolutely true. It doesn't matter for some what God does. They could see it all, but still in rebellion reject who he is and what he offers. I, I can't relate to that. I think as Christians, we, we, we see that and hear it and know it, and yet it's so hard to get a grasp on to relate to because it's not where we're at and it's not what we choose, but it doesn't make it any less true. Who's able to stand? And we're done. The question is given, and there seems to be no answer, right? It's a self-evident answer. 
Paul gives an answer. Read this with me and we'll close. He says, therefore, since we, that's you and me, I pray, believers in Jesus Christ, since we have been made right in God's sight by what? Faith, we have peace with God because of what Jesus Christ our Lord has done for us. Because of our faith, Christ has brought us back into or into this place of undeserved privilege where we now stand. And we confidently and joyfully look forward to sharing God's glory. Lastly, someone said, God can't ignore sin. We see that here, don't we? So too, we can't ignore the fact that he gave his son to die for our sin. Father, we thank you for your word this morning. I pray that it's the practical that we grab a hold of today so much more than the theoretical, so much more than what we don't know, to lay a hold of what we do. And that is simply this. Final judgment is a fixed point in our history. It's already on its way, and we've got work to do. You've called us to be fishers of men to be light and salt in this world, to be ambassadors of Christ. God, would you help us to be about that business? Would you raise us up as those who invest our time, our talents, our treasures into your church? Would you help us to be at work in the world, God, to this simple end, that your people could safely arrive in heaven, having been ushered by our sweet service in this life. God, would you use us to save souls? There are souls right now in our life, Lord, who are headed for hell. They're headed for this time and day and age. And we're not okay with that. And so we'll pray for them by name. We'll season their life so carefully with love. We'll declare the truth, Lord, of Jesus. And God, we won't stop until we see them saved. Would you sharpen us today as you sober us about all these things and help us, God, to be sensitive to your Holy Spirit, to be productive for you. God, strip us of just dumb stuff today, just stupidity, Lord, foolish things, waste of time, waste of money, waste of, God, our focus. Would you sharpen us And help us, Lord, ensure that we're about our Father's business. Thank you. Holy Spirit, have your way. You are the one who works wonders in the hearts and minds and lives of your people. Go with us now as we make it our aim and prayer to respond to your word with obedience. In Jesus' name, God, bless your people. In Jesus' name, go with us, Lord. Set us apart as those who uphold your name. In Jesus' name we say together, amen, amen, amen. If you'd like any kind of prayer, if you have a need, come on up. We've got some wonderful...